I apologize for the lack of YouTube videos recently. I'm still a little bit burnt out, but I'm doing my best. Okay, let's go. We played him twice, actually, so I'm not going to play repeat opponents too many times unless there's nobody else to play. Oh my god, Chessmeister 2, 2431. That's a pretty darn high rating. Well, let's go. 2431. Let's go Knight F6. And obviously against a player this high rated, this is the highest rated player we've faced in the speedrun ever. So I have to play my main repertoire that I can't dicker around here, which means we're going to play the King's Indian. And our opponent is trotting out the Fianchetto uh, variation, which is one of the most reputable and positionally dangerous responses against the King's Indian. Of course, it's the line where white plays g3, and Fianchetto is their kingside bishop, and then typically castles kingside. Now, so far, we have not committed to a King's Indian. We commit to a King's Indian when we push the d-pawn up to d6. We can also play this in a Grunfeld fashion. We can castle and push d5. Or we can play this in a Grunfeld Slav fashion. And this is the recommendation of a lot of, of sort of modern day chess literature, which is to play c6 and then d5. And that line does equalize. There's no doubt about that. But it's more fun and more in the spirit of my repertoire to play this in a more traditional King's Indian fashion, which is why we play d6. And here we reach a very wide theoretical crossroads. Black has a million different setups against the Fianchetto variation. And I would say that these setups are broadly divided into three categories. There are setups where Black prepares e5. This is what we're going to play in this game, because this is the most traditional and King's Indian-esque variation. There are setups that involve playing the move c5. This is what Gawain Jones recommends in his chessable course. This lends the flavor a more Benoni, uh, lends the game a more Benoni flavor. Then there are systems where you play neither e5 nor c5, at least not immediately. You can play c6. Um, you can play bishop f5. You can play knight c6 and a6, which is the Pano variation, one of the main lines against the Fianchetto. So there's a staggering number of variations, and they're all pretty decent. But we're going to choose the one that I've played for the longest time, and that's knight b to d7, and quickly pushing e5. Now, white's main response is to strike back in the center with e4, and that's what our opponent plays. And here I've played two different variations in my chess career. The first is e takes d4, a trading off in the center immediately, then paying a visit to c5 with the knight, and putting pressure on this you could think of it as a Marozzi bind. This is not a Mar Marozzi bind refers specifically to the structure that occurs in the accelerated dragon. Um, but you can think of the pawns on e4 and c4 as kind of a Marozzi bind like construction. And this position does resemble an accelerated dragon in that after e takes d4, black is cramped and white is a big space advantage, but black applies long lasting pressure to white center. And if white doesn't handle the position with great care, then white center can collapse. But in this game, I'd like to play a second line. And this is an older line. This is what I used to play over the board when I was, you know, up until international master level. And I still play this almost exclusively in blitz because it's an incredibly tricky line. And it's a line that often slips through the cracks of even very experienced uh, Fianchetto players. So you start with the move C6. And again, if you've watched my stream, then you've probably seen me play this line. The point of the line is to bring the queen out to a5. I might have even had this in a speedrun game at some point. So, you know, if, if memory serves me right. But this line is incredibly tricky. And our opponent already demonstrates very, very good knowledge of this system. The move bishop e3 is the sort of new recommendation. Um, as far as I know, this is what, like, the top grandmasters play nowadays. The old move, which almost everybody played up until a year ago was rookie one. And I'll give you the lowdown on this line after the game. I'll give you some theoretical overview and I'll show some cool traps. After bishop e3, we're supposed to release the tension with e takes d4. This is theory. So I'm not explaining these moves uh, deeply. I'm just making them because they're the theoretical moves. At this point, we discharge the tension in the center. And the reason we do it, I think, at, at this precise moment 
is because white is already prepared to push d5 and close the center down. And the bishop on e3 is very harmoniously placed. So this is our sort of last opportunity to exchange the pawns before white closes the center. And white is at a further crossroads. There's bishop takes d4, and there's the more tr traditional recapture, which is, of course, knight takes d4. Most of the time, when black plays ed, white doesn't even have the option of bishop takes d4. So most players who are not as experienced kind of automatically play knight takes d4. Clearly, our opponent realizes that, th that there's a choice to be made here. And make no mistake, like if you run this through the computer, yeah, white is better, but white has to demonstrate tremendous precision, as is true in most King's Indian lines, in order to prove that advantage. And from the point of view of a rapid game, black has a lot of easy moves, black has a lot of ways to create threats, and if black seizes the initiative, you know what happens in a King's Indian where black has the initiative. So I really, really believe in this line. I mean, hopefully I'll be able to demonstrate it against a really, really strong player. Our opponent is thinking. I'm pretty sure you had this in a previous speedrun game since Soup the Sailor. I'm pretty sure of that too. Maybe even in this speedrun, although I don't remember when. I feel like I have definitely played this Queen A5 variation um, before. So if, if you remember that game, you can let me know. But doesn't really matter. Um, it's been, I think, a sufficient amount of time has passed. So our opponent plays the annoying move. I didn't want to say what the what the annoying move was just in case, but bishop takes d4 is the move I really dislike playing against. The reason is that your standard response will be knight e5. But in response to knight e5, white has a tactic, and this tactic just kills the line. Knight e5 is almost a decisive mistake, believe it or not. Does anybody know what the idea is against knight e5? And that is why we have to keep this knight on d7 for the time being. If we play knight e5, we walk into... What do we walk into? It's a very unusual tactical idea. Very unusual. Extremely... Yes, yeah, c5. White undermines the knight with c5. And typically, you're just able to take on f3. But white recaptures with the queen. And the knight on f6 is suddenly hanging, right? That's the power of recapturing with the bishop. So knight e5 walks into c5. And that is why we want to make a more flexible move. So let's make, let, let's sort of pick the low hanging fruit and start with rookie eight, which is a move that will not harm our position. That is for sure. Let's wait for white to kind of show his cards and then we'll make a more substantive decision about how to position our pieces. It'll, it's possible that our queen on a5 has done its job and should drop back to c7 in order to make knight e5 possible because. We can't keep this knight on d7 forever. It blocks the bishop on c8, and it causes our position to be very cramped. We, of course, can deploy the knight to c5, but I like that a lot less in this position for a couple of reasons, one of which is that with the queen on a5 and the knight on c5, obviously white has like a3 before ideas, but also knight c5 just seems very flimsy. Maybe white can push in the center with e5, and white can very easily defend the e4 pawn. So... While knight c5 might be tempting to attack the e4 pawn, I really, really think that the knight is better positioned on e5 in this line. And these are the sorts of things that you just feel, right? When you play a line many times, you make a lot of mistakes. And at some point, you start developing a finer understanding of where the pieces belong. And it can't always be explained verbally, like step by step. Like, this is exactly why this piece goes here and that, that piece goes there. A lot of it has to do with feel. Okay, so rookie one. And I do think we should drop our queen back to c7, because knight e5 still allows c5. Um, and the queen on a5 is kind of neither here nor there. So I'm, I'm very much inclined to play queen c7, and then jump out to e5 with our knight. We've got other ways that we can maneuver around the, you know, the, the hurdles. We can play knight f8 and knight e6, kind of a Rui Lopez style idea. But this to me seems a lot more King's Indian esque in nature. Let's go knights. Let's go queen, queen c7. Yeah. Cramped position for sure. Cramped position, but a very solid position. Classic King's Indian situation. What was the idea? A lot of people are asking, what was the idea of queen a5? I will explain that after the game. It's harder to see it because of what our opponent played, which is bishop e3. If our opponent had played the main move, which is rookie one, then I think you would have really understood the value of this queen. Sometimes it can swing over to h5. That's like one easy thing to, to understand. 
And the other like broad thing is that it aims at the knight on c3. So the move b3 is a very useful move for white in these positions to defend the c4 pawn. With the queen on a5, b3 is not possible. And it's actually a very common blunder at lower levels. I've even beaten title players like this. They play b3 automatically without realizing that the knight is now hanging. So in many situations when the c4 pawn is attacked from b6 or e5, it's actually very hard to defend that pawn adequately if you've got if you don't have the ability to play b3. Okay, queen c2. Well, our opponent continues to improve his position. I think that we should do the same, and we should probably follow through on our plan and play knight e5. Okay, I think black has a pretty decent position here. I think white has a very powerful move here. Super advanced move. We'll see if our opponent finds it. This is a very advanced move. I think most people who look at this position I think most people would take on e5, but generally that trade favors black. And the reason is really simple. I've talked about this at length before. When you get the quote unquote symmetrical pawn structure in the King's Indian, it's actually not symmetrical at all. And the chief difference is that white's got pawns on c4 and e4. So white is a big, big weakness on the d4 square, which really comes out in the event that black plays d takes e5. Black, on the other hand, has this pawn on c6, which is restricting the knight on c3. So knight takes c5 is a positional mistake here, in my opinion. And I've won a lot of games in that structure because ultimately you just shuttle your knight around to d4. And our opponent, of course, plays the advanced move. I had no doubt in my mind. And now we reach a, I think, a very important position. So knight d2 drops the knight away and protects c4. Clearly, it's also preparing the move f4. Now, f4 is not the end of the world. It sends our knight back to d7, but in the King's Indian, you have to be totally comfortable moving pieces back and forth. With that said, I don't want to allow f4 because I really, really do. I want to try to entrench and establish this knight on e5, if at all possible. So we ask ourselves the question, is it possible to stop f4? And I actually think it is. We can make a positionally risky move. This is a risky move. It's con it, it has its drawbacks. This is what the King's Indian is all about. You have to know and feel the situations in which such moves are necessary. What are, what are we talking about here? This move does not physically prevent f4, but it discourages it. I'm talking about the move g5. This in and of itself is a construction that you might find familiar. Like you put a knight on e5, and then you put a pawn two squares away. You do this, if you translate this to the right side of the board, in the King's Indian, you play knight c5 and then a5. It's the same exact principle. If white plays f4 now, my idea is to trade once on f4 and drop the knight back to g6 to put more pressure on the f4 pawn. Then the situation gets a lot more tactical, which is really to my liking. I feel like our king is a little bit safer than white's in that position. Thank you, Red Calamity. All right. So we're trying to... Also, the move g5 has opened up the g6 square for the knight. So knight g6 is only a move made possible by the push of the pawn. Now, why am I not more worried about the weakness that we create? First of all, this is less drastic of a weakening move than it may appear. Because, you know, we still have our fianchettoed bishop. Our king is still safe. It's not like we play g5 and the world ends. Yes, it's a risky move positionally also because we weaken the f5 square. So oftentimes you will see white immediately burying the knight over to e3. But the f5 square is also guarded by our light squared bishop. So I'm not too worried about an outpost on f5 in the near future. It's kind of hard for white to find a move here. This is what I find to be the case in uh, the Fianchetto variation. White just burns a ton of time. Black is worse, objectively cramped, yes. But sometimes black's play is just more clearly defined. Okay, so our opponent has spent... Close to half uh, their time, and it's only move 14. I'm already keeping a close eye on white's clock. What's our next move going to be? Well, we've got a couple of, you know, again, I call this low-hanging fruit, by which I refer to moves that you, you know that these moves are not going to hurt your position. So what are, like, the easy things that we can do? Well, first of all, we can develop this bishop. But we need to be mindful of where we develop it. I think most people would be tempted by bishop e6. But after bishop e6, white can play b3, and that's not the issue. The issue is that subsequently, when white plays the move f4, we're in trouble because we cannot play knight g6. White pushes f5, forking our bishop and our knight. So actually, it might be a better idea to play the more modest move bishop to d7. 
All right, so that F4 could still be met after the preliminary exchange with the move knight g6. What other moves can we consider? Well, we actually can play h5 and try to go g4. This is a more advanced and involved plan because it weakens more of our king side. But if we can play the moves h5 and g4, what we do is create a essentially lifetime bind on the king side because then any time that white will try to play f4, we will take on Passant and weaken White's kingside tremendously. So that's a more, you know, plan that is involved with more risk. In terms of small improving moves, other than bishop d7, I don't see all that much that we can do. b3. Okay, so b3 gives us a pretty wide choice. Our opponent just kind of passing the move. I really like the plan of h5 and g4. And you might ask, well, can, can we play g4 immediately? And the answer is no, because then white plays h takes g4, and the whole purpose of that move is defeated. We're not actually stopping white from playing f4. So really, I think the choice is between bishop d7 and h5. And as a self-respecting King's Indian player, I almost always err on the side of the more, you know, the riskier, the more interesting move, the move that's more challenging. And I think h5 is a very challenging move, especially in light of white's clock situation, because our opponent will now see that we want to go g4. What does that mean? Well, that means he's going to start calculating f4 because f4 is a serious candidate move. And this might be white's last chance to play that move because after we play g4, we will get that bind in place. Well, I like h5. I think, it's a, I think it's a very testing move. Okay, less than seven minutes now for our opponent. Not to get too transfixed on the clock, but it is a very important factor uh, in any position. And now that we've reached this higher level in the speed run, you know, I'm, I'm telling you exactly the sorts of things that I would focus on in a real rapid game. And in a real rapid game, I would already be like pretty much obsessed with White's clock and making moves that are simultaneously healthy, but also give White a big choice. Okay, I, I hate it when people pretend that, you know, you're not supposed to talk about the clock because it's not a legitimate part of the game. It absolutely is. And knowing how to handle both your and your opponent's clock will give you Massive, massive rating bonuses. Okay. We're waiting for our opponent's response here. Obviously, he's going to start playing a lot faster in just a couple moves here, I would, I would imagine. Yeah, so... Bit, rook AD1. Yeah, this is what I thought uh, White would do. Our opponent is just sort of making straightforward, improving moves. Let's just make sure that G4 is the best that we can do. Of course, we can also play the move H4. And the move H4 is a very sensible candidate move. Actually, it might be worth spending a little bit more time contemplating this move than it may appear. What's so great about the move h4? Well, h4 is a classic positional idea. You are trying to lure white into playing g4. And if white plays g4, then again, the move f4 is virtually impossible to achieve. We get this big, big bind on the dark squares in the center. So h4, very much possible. White can take and play f4, but that leads us to, once again, serious complications on the king side that I think might favor black. But I'm not sure. I mean, that, that is a very complicated position. So we can go g4 as originally planned. We can do neither. We can play bishop d7 here and kick the can down the road, right? Since we're not too worried about white playing f4. Mm, this is a hard, hard, uh, hard decision. But my inclination is to play g4. My heavy inclination is to play g4. But the move g4 is also associated with positional risk because it weakens, for example, the f4 square. So one thing that white could do is shutter, shuttle this knight around to f4. Not that that's such a big, huge, cataclysmic square, but still, we should be mindful of the squares that we're weakening when we push our pawns like this. Okay, let's go g4. This just I feel like this has to be the move. This is, this is principled. It's what we've been building up toward, and... It would be a big relief if we didn't constantly have to worry about the prospect of f4. Okay, hg. Well, obviously, we play hg. The white buys himself a tempo, but I would draw your attention to the fact that the h file is now open. And we're not as far away as it may appear from exploiting that. I think we're actually like three or four moves away from being able to pick up on that h file. We can play something like bishop h6, king g7, and rook h8. Bang. Now, when a rook gets to h8, it's not checkmate, but at least we create the potential preconditions for tactics on the h-file. 
We can even consider king h8, king h7, king g6, and rook h8, but I would rule that out on the basis of this knight maneuver to f4, which will send our king right back to h7. And so that's why it's so important to constantly keep in your mind a list of the squares that you're weakening when you, when you play a lot with your pawns, because that helps you rule out certain options. Like, okay, I know that f4 is a weakness, so I need to be mindful of this maneuver. I know that f5 is, weak, is a weakness, so I need to be mindful of this maneuver. There we go, 92. Okay. Now things are getting spicy. Our opponent walking around to f4. Let's, let's think for a second. So I guess one question is, do, do we want to prevent or try to discourage knight f4, or do we not care? If we don't care, then we can play bishop h6 and keep going with our plan. If we do care, one thing we can consider is the move knight to h5. And I actually really like the look of knight h5. Because it's not easy to see how knight h5 actually stops knight f4. And it doesn't. White can still play knight f4. But after knight takes f4, g takes f4, knight g6, we trade the bishops. And white's got this long-lasting weakness on f4. That's actually going to be, I think, really hard to defend. The position there gets super spicy. But maybe it's a little bit on the dubious side. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to think some more. Ah, I've come up with another interesting idea. I've come up with another very interesting idea. This one is really cute. What if we go not knight h5, but knight to h7? What if we try knight h7 here? I'm looking at this f3 square, and I really would like to increase our bind over these light squares that we have garnered by pushing the pawn to g4. And it makes sense, I think, to bring this knight around to g5 so that it can jump into f3, jump into h3, and in general, just crab legs on the king side. Mm, it's got its drawbacks. Like the knight on g5 is not stable. It can be pretty easily attacked, for instance, with white's bishop. But I think in light of white's clock situation, we should give this move a shot. Knight h7, the best move in chess. Okay, bishop e3, preventing knight g5. But I saw that and I thought we could reinforce that with queen e7 or bishop, bishop f6. Let's think about this for a little while longer. Because now white actually might be preparing knight to d4, followed by knight f5. We should keep track of that idea as we devise our next move. Okay, so the, the, the options here are to play bishop f6, queen e7, everything to prepare knight g5. Okay, I need to think in silence for a bit here. This is an important position. Rook e6 is also interesting, by the way. Ooh, fine. Hmm. I could spend 30 minutes on this position. Which I'm not going to do, don't worry. Okay. I'm going to go with my initial idea. We're going to go queen e7 here. We're going to go queen e7. And this is, I think, the most obvious move, right? You're bringing the queen from c7 to e7, where it is a little bit more equipped to join the action on the king side. But the main idea is to prepare knight g5. Now, you might look and say, well, I don't understand why knight g5 is even on our plate here, because white can play bishop takes g5. But the trade of the bishop for the knight gives us a monopoly over the dark squares, right? Then our bishop on g7 is going to be really happy. Now, this is what I was worried about. This is an incredible maneuver by white. Knight e2, bishop e3, and knight e4. Way over my head, to be honest. But okay, we're going to deal with that. We're going to deal with it by trying to adopt an interesting defensive setup. Here's what I was thinking we might do. Here's what I was thinking we might do. I think that we should go... I think we should go queen f6 here. Just getting the queen onto its optimal square. Getting the queen to its optimal square. I'm expecting white to play knight f5 here, right? And complete his maneuver. And after knight f5, we should resist with every fiber of our being the temptation to play bishop takes f5. I think that would be a serious positional mistake. Because following e takes f5, not only have we given up a uh, light squared bishop, and our whole play on the king side is predicated on light square control. So we need this bishop for future use. But in addition, more importantly, after knight f5, bishop f5, ef, white gets this juicy e4 square for his other knight, then the d6 pawn will collapse, and then our whole position collapses. So it's so important. This pawn on e4 is what's saving our life, because all of white's pieces want that square for themselves. So after knight f5, we're going to drop our bishop back to f8 in order to lend an additional defender to this d6 pawn. And I know it looks really awkward, but I actually think it's a very watertight defensive construction. Rook f1 is not scary unless our opponent is preparing f4, 
which I kind of assumed was not achievable, but I guess it is. So we can play knight g5. We can also try to throw in bishop h6 and trade the dark squared bishops, which, as I discussed, was a good idea positionally. But maybe bishop h6 fails tactically. I don't know. Well, again, need to think in silence for a bit because this gets super complicated. I like the look of bishop h6 from a positional standpoint. But it's also risky because you give up the king's Indian bishop, which is also a defensive maverick in such positions. Hmm. Really, really hard decisions here that our opponent is making us take. Yeah, I, I honestly don't know whether we should play bishop h6 or not. My positional sense is telling me yes, but tactically I'd be really scared of our king safety. I think the x factor here might be white's clock. I'm going to make a bet that white does not have enough time to punish us for the move bishop h6. Well, of course, the guy's 2400. He's, he's probably like strong master level IRL. So this is, with the black, it's not going to be an easy game. I ex wasn't expecting one. I was not expecting an easy game. I think both of our sets of pieces are very nicely placed. This has been a high-level maneuvering game. I'm proud of the way that, that I've played on the king side. And we are just like a couple steps away from really instituting a, an, a, an unstoppable bind on the king side. Yes, white still looks very solid, but here's what could happen. Let's say white trades on h6. We're able then to get our knight to g5. At that point, we will be only two moves away from setting up unstoppable threats. Remember that old friend, king g7 and rook h8? Well, that's kind of what I'm aiming toward. c5, Jesus. That I was absolutely not even close to being on my radar. Like, I saw this possibility, but I didn't think he would play it here. Guess it's a good move. I don't know. And if we take, take, and go queen h6 here? At that point, the pawn structure gets really bad for white. So that is very attractive to me. Very attractive. Yeah, we're not resisting. Oh, but knight c4. Ah, oh, but knight takes c4. My gosh, it gets complicated. Let's take. And queen h6. Why queen h6 and not queen g5? Because we want to reserve the g5 square for our knight. Are, am I sure that we're going to go knight g5? Of course not. The position is highly unpredictable, but you have to set yourself up for success. Now we've created concrete weaknesses in white's position that are easy to attack. The drawback, of course, is that we've given white the f file. Why don't I care about that? Because I feel like there's nothing on the f file for white. Now we're looking for some tactics. I'm looking at the rook. I'm also looking at this d3 square. I think we can play dc. Well, we definitely should play dc anyway, regardless of what we're doing next. And after queen c5, we have a Forkovich on d3. And suddenly white's position showing some signs of weakness. It, what's funny is we might actually refrain from playing knight d3 because there's a case to be made that this knight on e5 is such a strong piece that it's not worth winning the exchange for it. So after queen takes c5, it's, it's probably worth considering the move knight to g5. So strong is our knight, but probably we will in fact play knight d3. I, I don't think I can resist the temptation to win the exchange. Okay, our opponent does not take on c5, seeing knight d3. Okay, so what happens now? Well, our queen is hanging, and as I mentioned earlier, bishop takes f5 comes with a very steep price tag. After e takes f5, white gets the e4 square for their knight. But at this point, the circumstances have changed. Our queen is no longer on f6. So the move knight e4 is no longer going to come with tempo. So how do we set ourselves up for the possibility of knight e4? Well, I definitely think we should take this knight. I don't think that we should let this knight exist on f5. And now I think we should go knight g5. I think this is the critical move. And largely, knight g5 is a prophylactic move. Actually, ooh, knight f6 would have been nice. Oh, man, I completely forgot about that. Knight f6 would have been awesome. I forgot about knight f6. Knight g5 is a stubborn move, right? This is what I always wanted to play. So I still think it's a good move because we have the prospect now of playing knight h3 check. Forcing the exchange of bishop for knight and the g3 pawn is going to be super weak. And the other knight is threatening to jump into f3. So suddenly white's position, I think, is starting to crumble. And it can crumble really, really fast because we're not even done. We can bring our rook over to d8 and intensify the pressure down the center. Knight c4. It feels like our opponent is crumbling, but we have to be uber precise in our execution here. And what that involves is deciding which knight we want to put on f3. I think it should be knight e to f3, but I'm not sure. 
Knight e to f3, king f2, knight h3. Yes, I'm pretty sure that we should play knight e f3 here. Oh, wait. Mm, yeah, okay. That, that's kind of... This is all predicated on one very like flimsy line that I just calculated, and maybe I should have spent longer. But I'm pretty sure that black is winning. Maybe not. Maybe not. It's going to get super tactical here, which is why I'm really happy we left ourselves with a lot of time. Okay, so here, critical moment. I think a lot of you are tempted by the move queen h2. That's a terrible move for many reasons, but one of which is rook takes g4. And suddenly the knight on g5 is pinned. So we have an opportunity train that we need to jump on right now because we will not get another chance to play this move. And the move I'm talking about is knight h3 check. We stick that knight in there before it's too late, forcing white to take it. Otherwise, we capture the rook. Then we take back with a queen. And I didn't see a defense for white in that position. I think we're just winning on the spot here. We're threatening to win white's queen with queen h2. You should see that. That's a skewer. But queen h2 is a standalone threat. Even if it didn't win white's queen, it would lead to a mating attack. I'm pretty sure that white has no defense here. But maybe he'll find something with his last seconds. Rook takes f3, by the way. We still go queen h2. We don't actually recapture the rook, which is problematic for white because I don't think white has a move. Man, if we can finish this one off, that this would be a really nice game. I would be proud of this one if, if we're able to drive this one home because this just shows you how versatile and rich of an opening the King's Indian is and in how many different ways you can win a game in the King's Indian. But let's count the chickens when they've hatched. No, our opponent actually played a very good game. I think the mistakes came at the very end. But wait, all of this is a moot point. Let's actually win. But the win here plays itself. What we need to do is drive the white king out into the center and then deliver a decisive check with our rook on d8. This is done with a zigzag mechanism that you should be familiar with. You check on h2, you check on g1, you staircase the queen to g2. The king is driven out to the target square where it is picked off by the rook. Notice that white has no threats down this diagonal, so we have nothing to worry about. We just deliver the checks. And it's a moot point anyway, because white isn't able to garner a tempo. Rook a d8. All pieces are participating in the attack in what is likely to be the final position of the game. Unless our opponent gives us the chance to deliver mate. And resigns. Nice game. Okay. Our highest rated opponent in the speedrun. There's a lot to talk about. I won't bore you to death with the opening theory, but definitely a lot of context to, to formulate. I'm going to pull up chess base just so I can um, make sure I'm not lying to you when it comes to theory. Yeah, super fun game and a lot to explore. I'm sure a lot of mistakes were made by both of us. It's impossible not to in games this complex. So we're going to skip directly to the critical position. I won't, you know, explore the theory of the other lines here. If you look at Gawain Jones's chessable course, you can explore C5 here, which I think is maybe objectively the best move. At some point, Knight C6 and A6 was all the rage. Um, as it was also against the same-ish, but not as much anymore. Knight BD7 got more popular uh, in the last couple of years. At some point, this fell out of favor entirely. So white castles, black plays e5. Of course, e4 is not white's only move. The other main alternative is queen c2. And here you're supposed to play ed4 and knight b6. Very tricky line that you've probably seen me playing extensively in Blitz. Um, but there's definitely enough to enough to talk about in the in the e4 line. So again, the other line that I've played is e takes d4 and knight c5, which, which does get a very classic pawn structure. And I've, I've experienced this pawn structure from the black side for the majority of my chess career. I feel like I know the ins and outs of this structure and all of the maneuvers. And what makes it so interesting is that the engine is always skeptical in this structure about black's chances. It's always 0.6 or 0.8. And that dissuades a lot of people from going into it. But you can trust me that white's position is exceedingly hard to play properly because there are so many tricks. There's just so many everything here. And black's pieces have so much potential that I truly believe that from a practical standpoint, you know, this structure is very much worthwhile for, for, for black. I have won countless quick games in this structure with uh, just an endless amount of tricks. Here's just one quick example. Completely different opening, but you'll see the parallel. So this is a game that I played against a very decent player, like 1860. And this was not San Francisco. This was Reno. I don't know why. Okay, this is ticking me off. Let me, let me save it. 
says Reno. Okay, so here's what happens. Um, he plays an English, and we reach this structure, right? I play the King's Indian. It's a Fianchetto English. At first, I played the Knight C6, A6 plan, and we reach this structure, right? Not exactly the same thing, but, but it's defined by the pawns on e4 and c4. Now, watch how quickly his position collapses. Knight d7 and knight c5, typical. Knight b4. And already he makes the losing move here, knight d4. Who can tell me why this is a losing move? He's trying to contest the square on c6, completely forgetting why I put the knights on b4 and c5. Yeah, this is uh, chess base, the, the new theme. Because I said it was. Very good. Nicely done. What does black do here? Knight d3. Which knight? Well, not the one that's guarding c6, because this would walk into a fork. Rather, you play knight cd3, interfering between the queen and the knight and attacking the rook. But white goes knight c6, deflecting in turn my knight. But after the trade, I take this very important pawn on b2, and white's position collapses. Then I went back to b4, took another pawn, got my bishop out, and then brought my queen over to b2, and he resigned. So I can show you a million games like that, where white center collapses really quickly. And this isn't even a line that happened in the game. So let's get to the actual matter at hand, which is the move c6, the older move. So white plays h3, which is standard fare in this line. It, the idea is to prepare bishop e3 and take away the g4 square uh, from black's knight and you know, potentially even from the light squared bishop. Still mainline theory, h3. And now the move queen a5. So as I explained earlier, there are broad level points to this move, and then there are like the specifics. The queen on a5 is a very powerful piece because it's attacking from the side. It has the prospect of driving over to h5, which does happen in a line that I'm about to show you. And sometimes it can even move into b4, which is a surprisingly problematic move for white to face. So let's explore some lines, and hopefully these lines will not only contextualize this line, but kind of start to give you an understanding of why I really like this line and how tricky it is. White, again, has a way to get an advantage. Several ways, actually. But this requires not only vast theoretical knowledge, but knowledge of all of Black's tricks and all of White's key ideas. Let's examine some lines. The main move here is to play rookie one. This is the main move. And my computer is going to be a little loud here. Just warning you. In response to rookie one, you play e takes d4, knight takes d4, and knight e5. And here you see idea number one, the fundamental purpose of putting the queen on a5. White cannot play b3 because he drops c3. And it's hard to defend the c4 pawn. If white tries to do it with his queen, okay? If white tries to play queen e2, who can tell me? Actually, not who can tell me. Well, who can tell me a way to fork the knight on d4 and the pawn on c4. Who can see the move? Bang, bang, queen c5. There is another reason you put the queen on a5. And in order not to be worse, white has to play a bunch of engine moves. Like if bishop e3, then you already win the pawn and black has a great position. White's supposed to go rook d1, which is a you know, kind of a hard move to come up with. And here the position gets very wild. You play knight takes c4. And amazingly, white is unable to separate the queen from the knight. Like, white can try knight b3, but after queen b4, rook d4, um, the knight can be effectively defended with either bishop e6 or even b5. And black is already better at this point. So this is one easy way to lose the pawn. For that reason, most people traditionally go bishop f1 here. This is the main line. Of course, this takes the sting out of the move queen c5 because that no longer... Well, technically, queen c5 does hit the knight. That's funny. But here, white has the move knight b3, and you can't take the pawn. So queen c5 is futile. For that reason, you improve your position with rook to e8. In the main line, white completes his development with bishop e3, and so do we. And I've already shown this line in a previous speedrun game. In this position... Tons of people walk into a beautiful tactic. I've won tons of games like this in Blitz. I've even won an important rapid game with this trick. Anatoly Karpov blundered this in a classical game in which he played the move a3 against Pia Kromling, preparing b4. Who can remember the beautiful trick, a bolt from the blue if there ever was one? And here, the true reason for placing the queen on a5 is revealed. Knight takes e4. What the heck is the idea? 
Knight takes c4. If instead white plays b4, very importantly, you take the knight and hit the queen. That's a critical detail. Queen e1! Look at this. Queen e1. Queen e1. And because white played bishop back to f1, the weakness of f3 is what kills him. Knight f3 check. Knight takes queen. And everything works out perfectly because the knight is hanging. So when you count the material, you find that white is down in exchange. If white plays knight g5, then you evacuate your knight with tempo. Rook c1, knight takes e3, knight e6, knight f1, knight g7, knight d2, and the white knight is trapped. But even if it wasn't trapped, you could just play knight takes g3 and king takes g7 with two extra pawns. So this is just an extra credit line. But still very, very cool. Obviously, okay, if white takes the knight, then you also take the knight with an extra piece. Dude. That's the easy line. So that is the gist of this line. If white knows about the trick, knight takes c4, it's still not that easy to figure out a way to defend against it. Because you can't play queen d2, that walks right into the fork. Does anybody know what white's best move in this position is? It's a prophylactic move, which does, I wouldn't say it kills the line, but it casts a lot of doubt on this line. It is king g2. The best move, and most modern day GMs know this, is to play king g2 and permanently prevent the possibility of knight f3. Earlier, people would play f4 and chase this knight out of e5. You can actually sack the knight with knight takes e4 here. And I'm pretty sure that we did have a speedrun game that went exactly like this. From a practical standpoint, this is a great line for black. White plays f takes e5. If knight takes knight, then queen takes e1 still works because it hits the bishop. But after f e5, knight g3, white's position is exceedingly difficult to play. Why? Because you're about to pick up a third pawn. And if white plays e takes d6, there's yet another beautiful tactic. Who can tell me how we continue the initiative in this position? If you're watching on YouTube, make sure to pause the video. This is actually a crucial resource. Without this resource, the whole line would fall apart. The King's Indian is often predicated on tactics to make everything work in the end. It's rook takes bishop, rook takes rook, and now it's bishop d4, right? No, that blunders the bishop. So how do we pin this rook? We play queen c5, and again the queen on a5 makes its presence felt. Queen c5 pinning the rook. Well, white has to defend the rook. How does he do it? Well, if he does it with queen to d2, and the knight drops back to f5, and black's got way too many attackers on that rook, white can play rook a to e1, but now you simply play knight takes e3. If queen takes e3, then we win the queen. And if rook takes e3, we play bishop h6, hitting where it hurts. White again has to defend the rook with the knight, knight d1. And now we play it simple. We just take the rook. We play rook d8. We pick up the pawn. And we have a winning position because we've got the overwhelming majority on the king side. And white's got the long-term problems with the king. It's about minus two. So instead of queen to d2, white has to know the move queen d3, which is far from intuitive. And black is still better. Bishop d4, rook a e1. Knight f5. Continuing to apply pressure with everything that we've got. White continues to defend with everything that they've got. But after knight takes e3, knight takes e3, rook d8, I think that practically, black's position is better. The engine gives complete equality here. King moves away. We play rook takes d6. And here my file ends with the comment that black has fantastic practical compensation for the sacrificed piece in the form of two pawns, which very likely will become three pawns because white has no good way to defend the, B, uh, the b2 pawn. Now, if, for example, white plays b3, the queen swings over to g5 with the threat of queen g3, the threat of bishop e5, etc., etc. And this is after white's managed to find all of these moves. So I know these are very technical long lines. I know I'm probably, you know, I've lost some people. But for that reason, about 10 years ago, this move king g2 was discovered and it really removed the luster of this line at like the very top level. But at really any level below 2400, you can play this safely. And the black's position is still very much playable. So even if white knows the move king g2, I analyze this with an engine. And the best move here is to actually push h5 and prevent the further expansion of white's king side. Generally, white plays f4. And after knight ed7, I don't think that white is much better here, honestly. I think the position's close to equal. Um, because if white plays bishop d3, then the knight reroutes to c5, which is quite typical in the king's India. f4, believe it or not, is an inaccuracy. 
So white needs to be more patient, but it's not easy for white to find a plan. Like if white plays queen to d2, you drop back on your own power, knight ed7 attacking the pawn, forcing a weakening move such as f3, and now you play against white's dark squares. You play h4, g4, and who can tell me a very deep positional move that enables us to prepare to increase our control over the dark squares on the king's side? I'll give you a second. It's knight h7. It's knight h7. Again, exclaim knight h7. And the point of this move is to prepare the move g5. And this is very similar to what we did in the game. Once you play g5, white is stuck saddled with all these dark square weaknesses on the king side. And if white ever plays f4 to try to beat the curve, um, if white ever plays f4 to try to beat the curve, then black plays bishop takes c3. And the e4 pawn will be lost. And with the e4 pawn, white's whole position starts to crumble. bc, knight df6, you're going to take the pawn with the knight, and black has a big initiative. So from, again, what I'm trying to show you, not only is how to play this line from a theoretical standpoint, but also to show you just the, the gumption inherent in this King's Indian line. No matter how, white, how accurately white plays, there's always going to be practical problems. So that is the lowdown on the main line. Unfortunately, in this game, white played a very annoying move. There's two annoying lines that really come close to taking the queen a5 variation out of commission, and one of them is bishop e3. The other one is this move queen to c2. Um, and if I were to make a recommendation for white, it would be queen c2. I really think that this move casts a lot of doubt on, on this variation, because if black plays it the same way as the, the rookie one line, then white simply plays b3, and none of the tricks work in this position like literally none of them so my conclusion is that black's best move is to expand with b5 which leads to a very sharp line but white is better in the end like b5 i think the line goes de de and still like black can absolutely play this because if white plays cbcb already i think black is fine i think here the position is close to equal unless white knows a very difficult move which is to meet black at the top with b4. White has to know this move in order to gain an advantage in this line. Otherwise, black pushes b4 and puts a lot of pressure on the e4 pawn by fianchettoing the bishop. The point of b4 is to play rook b1. Black drops around to c4. And white develops a pretty annoying initiative with the move bishop a3. Basically, white's making a lot of tempo moves and bringing the other rook to c1. And black needs to tread very, very carefully here. Okay. So, finally, the move in the game is another reason why this line is not all that often played at the top level. I play d takes d4, and our opponent responds with bishop takes d4. What you need to know about this line is that I think the best move is, in fact, knight takes d4. And do not play knight e5 here, because here, after queen e2, again, none of the tricks really work for black. If you try to play this the same way that you play the rook e1 variation, white will put the rook on d1. This is actually the positional point of bishop e3. White is delaying the development of the rook so that in the event of queen or rook e8, white will be able to play rook fd1 and apply pressure on the d6 pawn. So for instance, if you play bishop e6, white trades on e6, and the rook on d1 is placed so much better than the rook on e1. Here, white has a very instructive and incredibly powerful positional move. Let's see if anybody can find it. I'll be pretty impressed. This is a very hard move. White to play and gain a decisive initiative. And it's not f4. We already know that f4 is almost never all that dangerous. I know most of you are probably thinking it's f4. And the idea is predicated on playing f4, but you have to do something first. You strike at the C yeah, you strike at the D file first, C5, and only when black takes and the D file is opened, do you push F4 and E5, driving a massive wedge into black's position with potentially decisive effects. In order to not lose a piece, black has to play this miserable move knight d5. And just look at this position. Like white's white's winning. Rook AD1 is coming, black's pieces are in shambles. This is a disaster. So that actually is the point of bishop e3. You see how deep it is. For this reason, 
I came to the conclusion that the only way to keep this line alive is to play the move knight to b6. Again, just hitting the pawn, same concept, just doing it from the dip from a safer side. And black is worse here. Black is worse, but you can play this. White has to know knight b3, hitting the queen. And now you swing the queen over to the other side. The second main idea of the move queen a5 is shown in this line. This basically forces an endgame, because if white plays g4, then, of course, black will play bishop takes g4 and develop a massive attack, as well as three pawns for the piece, because you're going to pick up c4. Um, so white has to trade queens. And the engine gives about 0.5 for white, but I really feel like, again, black's position is very much playable here. White is supposed to go g4. You drop the knight back to f6. And if white defends the c4 pawn, then obviously you bring your bishop out to e6 and you could play h5 later. You could push d5. I've had this a couple of times online and people really don't show anything here with white. So that is the lowdown from a theoretical standpoint. Now let's get to the text and let's enter the middle game. Our opponent plays bishop takes d4. Okay, so I'm seeing something very interesting with the engine, which is that apparently knight e5 is possible here. It's possible, and it's even the top engine move, but I don't like the ensuing position. So apparently after c5, black can play the very cold-blooded knight f6 back to e8. Now, obviously, it's generally not a great idea to trade the king's Indian bishop, but when the smoke clears, you get a very playable position for black. Slightly worse, for sure. Yeah, slightly worse, but very much playable. You're going to bring your bishop out. You can centralize your queen. White really doesn't have all that much to write home about. But somehow I was under the impression that c5 almost wins the game, so I decided to delay that move with rook to e8. Okay, rook to e1, queen c7. Top engine move here is knight h2, by the way. Crazy. How many times has the move knight h2 and knight h7 been a good move in this game <laughs> for both sides? Pretty ridiculous. Do you see anybody ever going knight h2? I mean, that's just crazy. Do you know what the idea is? I think I understand the idea. The idea is to make sure that this move does not make contact with the knight. It's prophylaxis. It's prophylaxis. You're tucking the knight away so that after black plays knight e5, you can simply go b3, and this knight is not contacting any of white's pieces. Right? Obviously, if you do the same thing here, black's knight has an out. It can play knight takes f3 check. So you're moving the knight away preemptively. Okay, our opponent plays queen c2. We played knight e5, and knight d2, I think, is a very strong move. I've shown you guys a lot of examples of mine in this structure. I've shown you probably three or four games at least where I was able to win straightforwardly by getting a knight and putting it on d4, like doing this, knight d7, f86, d4. One example that I really, really am proud of is a game I had, I think, in 2008. Let me see if I can dig it up real quickly. This is a game that I had many years ago against Eric Rodriguez, who was a uh, master from Miami. And he, Eric Rodriguez was like a D4 stalwart, so it was nice to beat him at his own game. Okay, let me just make the board a little smaller here. All right. So here's how the game went. This was a King's Indian. It was a main line. My opponent quickly trades on e5, reaching the same structure that we're talking about. It doesn't matter where this bishop is. It can be on g2, it can be on e2. It does not change the nature of the way that this structure works. And I just followed the textbook. Knight h5, knight f4, knight e6, right? You're already ready to sink the teeth of this knight into d4, which is exactly what I did. I played rook d8, and I played knight d4, and white's position is already miserable. Then... Who can tell me where should the other knight go? Where does the knight on a6 belong in order to buttress the knight on d4? Easy positional question. Easy positional question. Yeah, e6, right? You want to go knight c7 and knight e6? Simple chess, making sure that this knight is as stable as it can be. And the rest of the game, I developed some pressure on his b4 pawn. So it's not enough to put a knight on d4. You also have to do other stuff in order to continue keeping your opponent on his toes. A4, knight d4. Now the other knight comes in. Bishop developed. Ultimately, he was able to trade the knight, but the pawn on d4 is a beast. And then I was able to win the game. 
The rest of the game is outside of the scope of, of why I'm showing you this, but ultimately I had some really nice maneuvers. It wasn't a perfect game, but at the end of the day, the D pawn was the decisive pawn, and this is the pawn that was spawned, no pun intended, by the move knight d4. So let's go back to the game continuation. Hopefully this makes sense. So the takeaway is that this structure is almost always very unappetizing for white, with some minor exceptions. And your next move is going to be knight f8 and knight e6. Hopefully that makes sense. So our opponent made a very mature move, knight d2. Of course, if white plays b3, this is what we were talking about earlier. Black is able to take on f3 and take on h3, so this is out of the question. So this only leaves knight d2. G5. I actually am really proud of this move. I think G5 is a big reason why we won this game. The play that I demonstrated on the king side. And yes, yes, I'm sure that black is worse here. Maybe even plus over minus. But that's what the king's Indian is all about. And I think our opponent, one of his main mistakes in this game was maybe to play a little bit slowly. Although what he did initially, I think is really, really strong. I think the way our opponent set things up with B3 and Rook D1 is really well done. Like he's bringing all of his pieces into the center. Everything is nicely coordinated. And I actually think, I actually am convinced that a big mistake was to play H takes G4. Believe it or not, I actually think this supernatural move is a mistake. What, sh what do I think white should have done and why? Who can tell me an alternative? And I just checked with the engine. White kept a big advantage, but only by playing this other move, h4. Why? What is the difference between h4 and h takes g4? The difference is very positional. It's subtle. Now, first of all, the h file is frozen. That's a big deal. But that's not the main reason you play h4. The main reason has to do with restricting the knight on f6. This prevents the knight h7, knight g5 idea that essentially cost white the game. Okay, so the knight on f6 dies. And this pawn chain is able to keep all of Black's kingside pressure at bay. Whereas in the event of this trade, we were able to get the knight to g5, and in the end of the game, we were able to use the h file to develop a decisive attack. This is what these games come down to, these subtle positional moments. The computer evaluation here is plus 1.5. Black's position is bad. And what are some ideas that white can subsequently have? Well, this knight e2, knight f4 maneuver I think is particularly strong because the h5 pawn is a long-term target. So the engine gives b5 as a way to try to generate counterplay, which is another idea that you should always be aware of as a King's Indian player, b7, b5. The point is that if white takes, the queens are in a standoff and white's queen is undeveloped, is undefended. So after b5, white just has to cold-bloodedly cold respond with knight e2. And the engine line goes, bishop a6. Now. White continues with their plan, knight f4. Bc, knight c4. Now, obviously, the knight on e5 is the pride and joy of black's position, so you don't want to give it away. You take with the bishop. Bc, and black's position is just a stinking mess. White's got more space. White's got c5. White's got pressure on h5. I don't see a clear idea for black. Yeah, you've got a nice knight on e5. Congrats. But one nice piece isn't going to save you. So what's interesting is that if we rewind and we ask, well, where was my mistake? Yeah, probably g5 was a mistake from an objective standpoint. If white had played the correct move h4, black would have been in serious trouble positionally. Um, and I, I, I admit that. And I saw h4. I just figured we'd figure something out. I think this was the turning point in the game. So instead, our opponent plays hg, hg, and then knight e2. And this makes all of the difference. This move knight h7, it's the top engine move. And this is an equal position because of this knight g5 idea. Okay? So our opponent plays bishop e3 to prevent knight g5. And now we reinforce the idea with queen e7, preparing knight g5. This was, in fact, the correct move. Well, Red Hot Mama was asking, if the king side gets locked with h4, can't you convert to a queen side attack? Well, that's exactly what I was trying to do with the move b5. The problem is that the c4 pawn is so well protected. White can just completely ignore. Like, I would not play cb if I were white and allow black to generate counterplay down the C file. I would just ignore with knight e2. Um, Luca was proposing knight fd7, knight f8, and knight e6. Yeah, it's possible, but even if the knight gets to e6, even if the knight gets to e6, well, what is it doing there? The bishop's just going to drop back. 
So according to the computer, let's see what the computer gives here. 92, 98, knight f4, 96. Oh, wow. Look at this line. Knight f4, 96, calmly bishop c3, allowing knight takes f4 and knight g6. But white is winning here. Bishop takes g7, king takes g7. f5 apparently is the move. Now, knight takes h4 is bad because the knight will get stranded. And after knight e5, white pushes f4, pushing the other doubled pawn. And essentially, black's king is terrible, and the bishop on c8 is biting on granite. So in the long run, black's king is just not going to survive the onslaught. What white's going to do here is essentially move the king over to h1 and use the g-file to blast through. Even if black puts a knight on g4, still king h1, rook g1, and bishop h3. Totally unstoppable because black's bishop is never going to be able to get out of the prison, the prison created by these two pawns. Engines just think, I mean, who would have played like, who would play like this? Giving up the e5 square and then pushing the other f pawn. And it all starts to make sense at the end. So that's the way that you refute knight f8, knight d6. Okay, so back we go to the game. Queen e7, knight d4, queen f6. Rook f1, I think, might be a subsequent mistake after which black is better. And bishop h6, top move. I think that white had to go knight f5 here. Our opponent started hesitating because I think he was sensing that the position was getting worse. But I think white should play knight f5. Although I don't know what white should do here. I feel like white is out of concrete threats. The engine gives king h2, which is not a human move. Oh, the idea is rook h1 and king g1. Okay, it kind of is. Rook h1 and king g1 is the idea. So here, wow, what a line. Look at this line. Black plays bishop f5, ef, and bishop h6. Now, who can tell me, why does this look like a blunder? Or at, at the very least, a very inadvisable move. Why does bishop h6 look like an inadvisable move? It's because of knight e4. But watch these tactics. Queen takes f5. Bishop takes h6, queen h5, using the position of white's king to our advantage. Then we take the bishop, but white, not to be outdone, recaptures on d6. And the position is equal, according to the engine. Apparently, this is an equal position. But I would definitely take black, just because we have such potential of getting the knight to g3, g5 and then f3. White's pieces are kind of hanging suspended in midair. But objectively, the position is about equal at this point. After rook f1, white is already worse because we get this move in and we're able to trade dark squared bishops, which leaves white with a terrible bishop on g2. And this idea of knight g5 is an absolute game changer. Knight h7 was the game winning move here. So our opponent kind of resorts to desperation. I think probably c5 was another mistake, but not a big one. I think the biggest mistake our opponent made in this position was to play knight f5. I think after knight f5, the game is close to over. I think it's close to over. What should white have done? Well, without thinking, white should have played queen takes c5. And this is, I think, a grandmaster level observation. Because white, once black plays knight d3, 99% of players would reject this line. You would see knight d3, you see that you lose the exchange, and you think that's losing. But the grandmaster would keep calculating. Here's what I see. After queen c2, knight takes f4. Whoa, no. Queen c2, knight f4, ef4. If you look deeply at this position, you start to realize that white has massive, massive compensation for the exchange. First of all, white's pawn structure on the king side has been rectified. That's a big plus. But white has a specific idea that allows them to maximize the activity of the minor pieces while also restricting black's knight. What is likely to be white's next move? Pause the video if you're watching on YouTube. Ask yourself what white's next move is going to be. So for instance, the engine gives bishop e6 as the top move. It's going to be e5 to restrict the knight and open up a massive square for the knight. So for example, rook a d8, you drop the knight into e4. That knight can further go on to d6. Black's position is already unpleasant. Black's position is already quite unpleasant here. And apparently the correct line is to play f6, weakening the bishop. White can grab it and play queen c4 f5, f5, and you have a perpetual check, perpetual check with queen h6, queen e3. This is how the game should have ended. So actually, after queen takes c5, 
The hilarious thing is knight d3 is wrong. In order to keep an advantage, black's best bet is to play a simple move like b6 and chase this queen away. And after queen c2, for whatever reason, the best move is b5. Wow, b5. Who can tell me why? What is the point of b5? You play b6 to chase the queen away. That's understandable. Why is the best move b5? Such an instructive positional move. It's prophylaxis again. Prophylaxis again. You stop knight c4. Why is it so important to stop knight c4? Because that would trade off black's strongest piece. The knight on e5 is what makes black's position run. Okay, so if you rush with knight g5, white plays knight c4. And once this knight disappears, the c6 pawn becomes weaker. It becomes harder to attack. Therefore, you cover the two squares from which white can trade that knight off. C4 and F3. So prophylaxis, even in very sharp positions, can be a thing. But our opponent panics. He played knight F5, and this is the beginning of the end. I think knight F6 was more accurate, but I think knight G5 does the job as well. And knight C4 loses on the spot. Knight C4 loses on the spot um, to, to knight F3 check. Apparently, the only way to keep some chances alive was the very difficult move knight to E4. But black is still in fantastic shape. We can take on e4. We can slide the queen over to f6 to prevent white from playing f6 and gaining activity. Then we bring the rook into d8. Look at that monster knight. Look at white's weaknesses. This is minus over plus. So instead, knight c4, knight e f3 check. You might ask, why not with the other knight? Because here after king f2, the knight on e5 is super awkward. It's not doing anything. Instead, if we check with the other knight, then the knight from g5 can jump into h3. So look at the cooperation between the knights here. If white had played king to f1, then we should not play queen h2 because of queen f2, and suddenly black's queen is stuck in no man's land. Instead, we should use the center to our advantage. We should play rook a d8, and black is completely winning. Notice that white cannot take on h4, uh, g4 because of this fork. If white plays bishop f3, you take on f3, you slide the king over to f8, and much like in the game, all these threats are unstoppable. So this is very simple. King f2 and knight h3 check. Removing the final defender. And once the final defender is removed, the threats against white's king have become completely unstoppable. We zigzag our way to g2 and pick off and finish off the king with rook a to d8 check. The final move involves the first move we make with the rook, which I think is kind of artistic. Whew, what a game. So a couple of concluding thoughts. First of all, I introduced you to my favorite line against the Fianchetto. And we kept our analysis to the E4 variation. M let me be very clear. White has a million alternatives here. You know, th th there's bishop g5, there's queen c2, which I briefly mentioned. There's e3, there's b3. If You can't play the Fianchetto on the basis of this game alone. You can, but you have to study it more diligently. But that would be way, way, way too much. So c6 and queen a5, hopefully I was able to really bring out the beauty of the placement of this queen on a5. We focused on a lot of theory. We looked at rook e1 in depth. We looked at queen c2. There's other moves. There's the move d5. And here you take, take, and go b5, expanding on the queen side. Won't talk about this one. Then we analyzed knight takes d4. So we did some theory. And then, of course, we talked about the middle game. Knight d2 was a very nice move. I like this idea of g5, but the turning point in the whole game came in this position. And I always say that when we reach a higher level in the speedrun, the games, what decides the games, the margins are thinner and thinner and thinner. What decides the games are much less blunders. Then you hit like 16, 1700s, and it's still big tactical moments that decide the game or like massive positional mistakes. When you hit this level, it's the subtlest, it's the most nuanced moments that really decide the game. And when I say decide the game, I don't mean lose. H takes g4 is not a losing mistake, but it gives black a very easy game. And all of white's subsequent troubles stemmed from the fact that white did not play h4. And I think that's a fascinating aspect of chess, that things can come down to, think, to, to such a level of subtlety. So hopefully you enjoyed the game. I know this was very advanced, a lot of theory. I worked really hard to give you as much as I could. Um, I hope you enjoyed the game. And uh, I'm going to end here, guys, because this was very, very taxing. And I tried super, super hard. I tried super hard to, uh, to play my best. I mean, we played a 2400. Thank you. Thank you guys for hanging out today. Five-hour stream. A lot of blitz, a lot of bullet, a lot of action, a lot of fun. Thank you, everybody.